Next speaker is Daniel Watros. Daniel is an electrical and software engineer with 28 years experience creating software solutions for premier global technology companies like Micron, Hewlett Packard, and Trinet. His leadership and enterprise architecture of these companies has resulted in the successful modernization of key infrastructure and applications. Expertise includes automation, containerization, CICD, application modernization, and all things cloud. Today he's helping enterprises in Houston achieve this same modernization results in Google Cloud. Ladies and gentlemen, Daniel. What I wanted to talk about today, and, and I think this is a recurring theme in my own professional experience, is that to succeed at application modernization, you have to think about what that modernization means to the culture of the company, to the people. In other words, there, there are real social and cultural prerequisites to successfully delivering on application modernization. And the same it could be said for infrastructure modernization, IT modernization, basically anything you want to do or you think we want to get to a new place with our technology. So I think that um, maybe everyone's familiar with this. Hopefully everybody's seen something like this. There are a lot of different ways to move into a more modern posture. And, um, and this, this specific one, I'll talk about another one later in, the, um, in my, my presentation today. But this one talks about specifically moving to cloud. And a lot of companies today, when they think modernization, they think, how do I get to cloud? So that's, that's a big thing. Now, what's interesting is that the bottom left is where you think you are today. And the top right is where you think you want to be. And that might be true. So by the end of my talk, though, you might have a different idea about where you think you are and where you want to be. And hopefully, and I would say certainly, I want you to have a different idea about what that means with respect to the people and the company and, and what you want to accomplish in the world you know, with, with your contribution. So application modernization means something different to each person in the enterprise. Uh, I think everything starts with an application. And by the way, this could be an application that your engineering organization developed. This could be an off-the-shelf application that, that you acquire, that you purchase. This could be open source. It doesn't really matter what the application is. But if there's an application, you're hosting that on a server. Um, a long time ago, we used to use physical servers. Anybody raise your hand if you remember physical servers? Yay, there are a few dinosaurs in the room. This is great. So if there is an application running on a server, then there is a software engineer somewhere that's part of that story of delivering that. Now, if there's a server on which that's running, then you also have a system administrator that's part of that story. Now, as you accumulate more and more applications, you need some place to put them. You need to think about the infrastructure, uh, redundant uh, heat, redundant cooling, power, all these different things, the, the network. So you need a data center, which means now you need a data center operator. And you obviously have to have a network admin. I gave him a little Zeus tie. Anybody in here network admin? Raise your hand. OK, so we don't have any godlike people with us. but. But when you see them, you can just give them a high five and say, yeah, you're like Zeus. Now, when virtualization came along, the software engineer and the sysadmin, they basically did the same thing that they were always doing. But now you have a virtualization admin that steps into this and says, hey, how, how am I going to take care of this system? Now, you've got to obviously throw somebody in to think about security. You want monitoring. Maybe you've got audit that, that you have to think about. Um, consultants, obviously, to fill in the gaps around all of these skill sets that you need. You definitely need some contractors so that you can scale. Uh, vendors, obviously, want to come in and help sell you off-the-shelf software and support services to go along with it. You've got software as a service. Maybe you even introduce some appliances, physical or virtual. And I think you'll see that I'm going to run out of space on this slide before I run out of people roles in the company. So I could keep going and going and going. And what is important to understand about this is that every modernization effort is as much a story about the people as it is about the technology. It's not just a matter of, can I run this in a different place? Can I run this technology in a different way? 
It's that you've got to take into account what do all of these people contribute? Where do they fit into this story? And how do I get them invested? Right? And I think one thing that um, I think all of us have probably seen to some extent, some level, is that w when it comes to the people, we, we sometimes get these top-down initiatives like, hey, we're going to modernize, and somebody has their idea of what that means. And they don't, they don't take time to figure out what it means for each person, and you end up with a lot of friction and a lot of tension within an organization. And no clear direction saying, this is what modernization will mean to us as a business. This is what it will mean to us as, as individuals. So why and when modernization makes sense and when it doesn't? Um, at Google, we love, and by the way, I work for Google Cloud, so if you want to talk to me about Google Cloud, then, then I love to talk about Google Cloud. We love diagrams. So if you've got a modernization opportunity, um, there might be a number of reasons why that makes sense to pursue. But sometimes it just doesn't make sense to pursue. So from a money perspective, if there's a revenue opportunity that modernization gives you access to, then that might be a great reason to pursue it. Or cost savings. That's another good money reason. Um, toil, maybe by decreasing the amount of toil involved in how you deliver your technology to the company, to your customer, you can increase morale or accelerate the change that your customers are wanting. Maybe you can eliminate disruption. Uh, from a security perspective, if there are known vulnerabilities, maybe regulatory and compliance pressures, uh, you might think of a market advantage or even brand protection. In fact, um, one of the talks today focused on log for sh uh, shell, I think, and that as a brand, you, you become associated with the, the hacks that affect your company, right? So you know, if, if we're talking about um, the big three uh, credit reporting agencies, which of those do you trust the least? I don't know, but it might be Equifax because they got majorly hacked, right? So in other words, security isn't just a story about how do we protect data, it's how do we protect our brand? How do we make sure that the, the perception people have of us is one that we are competent to take care of their data and deliver the services they've asked us for? Uh, workforce, maybe you can't hire people, maybe you can't find people with the resource or the skill sets that match the technology you have. Maybe you can find them, but you can't afford them. Those would both be good reasons to modernize, to look at modernization. Um, employee retention, this can be a big one. How many of you have ever left or wanted to leave a company because they were so stuck in the past and unwilling to look to the future? Yeah, okay, I thought if I gave it a second. Like, so that's like a third of you. Like one out of three of you have thought, if I have to keep doing things the same way I've always done them, and I can't move into more modern technologies that are more secure, that are faster, you know, it becomes a question of career. We're going to talk more about that in a minute. Um, and then uh, skill set alignment, differentiation. Maybe there are market opportunities, competitive pressures, speed to market. Um, I could even go on obsolescence, licensing and renewals, merger and acquisition. There are tons of reasons to modernize. But if you can't find a compelling business reason, then here, let me go back here. If you can't find a compelling business reason, it's good to hold off. Business value and workforce productivity are the biggest modernization drivers. So saying there's a new version of software, or there's a new type of database, or there's a new X technology, or whatever, that's not what should drive your decision to modernize. Those might be cool, and as technologists, we love that stuff. Like, I remember the first time I, I learned about MongoDB, I'm like, this is so awesome, what can I do with this? You know, I just wanted to map it onto everything. And that was about 12 years ago that they first came out, I think. But, but that's not a reason to modernize. So uh, my kids love Harry Potter. They've read the books over and over again. In fact, I think I've bought the full set of books at least four times um, for my kids to read. And, and I would say, if you can't identify a compelling reason to modernize, then wait for one. It'll present itself. There will be good reasons to modernize. And I love this scene with, uh, with Umbridge getting up in front of everyone and saying, progress for the sake of progress must be discouraged. So don't modernize for the sake of modernization. Look for, for compelling business drivers and, and workforce drivers. So the personas involved in modernization, I think a lot of us would be tempted to start with the roles and the skills that I, that I started with. In other words, we're saying, 
okay, so what is the sysadmin going to do, or how can he do it differently if we modernize, right? We, we want to look at each of these roles. And what I would say is let's start with a different focus. Where does each person that we want to be part of this, where do they want to be in five years? So ask yourselves questions like, what, what career ambitions or goals do they have? Where do they want to live? Um, what, are the, what, what, what are their income targets? Industry, education, do they want to be an individual contributor? Do they want to be a manager? Um, and by the way, I see people in technology going both directions. I see, you know, maybe more people trying to get into management, but I see a lot of managers coming back into individual contributor roles because it feels so productive. It's so satisfying to deliver solutions. So, so you really want to ask yourself, where do people want to be? If people feel motivated, then they will find solutions to your migration and modernization problems. So, so find ways to, to motivate people. Now, how do you get the stakeholders on board and invested? So the stakeholder could be, you know, sometimes we talk about stakeholders and we think the C-suite, we think um, directors and VPs, they're important stakeholders. But the individual contributors are key stakeholders in any modernization effort. So align modernization with stakeholder goals. For example, does the director want to be VP? Then take the modernization and frame it in a way that sells the business value and strategic thinking. So that director looks like a VP so that he can deliver it and sell up in the organization. Does the programmer want to present at technical conferences like Houston DevOps Days? Who wants to present at Houston DevOps Days? Yeah, everybody should. This is awesome. I love being up on stage. Well, then make it easy for your developers and for your, your technology staff to publish what they're doing. They're coming up with interesting solutions. Just give them a little coaching on how do you generalize this? How do you remove what might be unique to our business? And publish this on the medium, on your own blog. Make a YouTube video. Make it easy for them so that that contributes to their career goals. Does the manager want increased access to resources or to expand the team? Focus on the expertise and the skills that would be required to succeed at modernization. And frame the modernization in, in a way that it is in the best interests or in the interest that it furthers those interests of the stakeholders. So the other thing would be to make each stakeholder a partner in the modernization effort. And, and one way to do this is offer more transparency around what the company needs and, and what the company's objectives are. So for example, does the business have to cut costs? This is something that management or leadership usually talk about behind closed doors, and you don't hear about it until, okay, yeah, we've got to, we're going to end this contract, or we're going to lay, you know, lay off people, or whatever. But if you've got that, then publish a target dollar value that the business needs to cut, and get every individual contributor to come in and say, hey, this is, this is something we could do that would help the business. In other words, that transparency, I think, can really be motivating. It also shows a huge amount of respect to the people that you're working with. Is there a revenue opportunity? Explain the differentiating qualities of that revenue that, that, that would allow you to acquire or secure that, that revenue win. And then let each person or group pro propose the ways that you could deliver it. If there are concerns about security or data integrity, then articulate to your staff what the possible risks are and why they matter to the company, and listen carefully to what your employees say. Be open to trying new things, and I would say even be open to trying old things that you've done before. Um, one thing I would say is that, especially in cloud, technology is moving so fast. If you say, you know, three years ago, we, we tried moving into Kubernetes and containers, and it didn't work, right? Then it might be worth another try. Kubernetes is not the Kubernetes of yesterday. The partner ecosystem, the tooling, everything about Kubernetes today is so different than what Kubernetes was a year ago, two years ago, three years ago. And, and just the, the ability for people to find the right materials and, 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 and ramp up on it. So be open to trying new things, but be open to retrying old things as well. So uh, a quick review of popular modernization approaches. Of course, we started here. This is really common thinking. You know, you can lift and shift. We're going to do the exact same thing that we do on-prem. We're just going to do it in the cloud. Um, 
you can move and improve, improve and move, whatever these things mean. Um, this, is, this is a rather ambiguous slide. Uh, and everybody, you know, kind of talks to this. Something that's a little more concrete, a lot of people like the R's, and I'm sure somebody out there is going to raise their hand and say, hey, you missed some R's. I know there are a lot of R's, right? But, um, but the point is that, you know, we could re-host, we could re-platform. <clears throat> we can look at each of these, these different things and say, does this match the workload? Does this match our, our skills and so on? I think, though, that these approaches ignore an important aspect of successful modernization. And that is that they focus on procedures and tools rather than activities and outcomes. And so I'm going to walk you through something here. I don't know how, how easy this will be to get over these couple of slides, but it's based on something I published several, several years ago. And so you can go out to my website and actually read my write-up on this. But to begin with, I start with a poorly defined outcome. And this is something that probably looks really similar to everyone. Data B matters to this company. And so they say, hey, yeah, we've got system A has records that capture data B and processes to ensure that data B gets replicated over to system C and D. Okay? So what do I think is a better outcome? A well-defined outcome would say department A needs data B to be available for all records related to entity C. Data B may also be useful to other departments and so should be available by request data B should be considered internal and confidential. So why do, I, why do I say that? So the poorly defined outcome, what you'll notice is it does identify an end state or deliverable, but it doesn't provide any clarity around what the business is actually trying to accomplish. In other words, you're saying, yeah, we've got this system, we've got that system, and over time, as the, as the business evolved, this turned into systems, you know, C and D and A and so on, but, but the clarity around why does, why does data B matter to the business and how do we treat it got lost. On the other hand, the well-defined outcome, it clearly focuses on the data. Why does this data matter to us and who cares, right? Who cares about it? Department A. And how it relates to other data, it even provides guidance on uh, data sensitivity and scope. So you'll notice also that it doesn't prescribe the implementation technology. So it's not saying this needs to be in a database, this needs to be replicated. It's just saying data B is important to department A, and it might be important to other departments, and, and, it's, uh, and this is how it relates to other data. So what if you can't rethink? In other words, so you know, I come back here. What if you, you don't have time to go through and say, let's, let's think not about the systems, but let's think about what the data means to the company. Let's think about why this matters to us as a business. Well, if you can't rethink it, I would say lift and shift works every time, right? If you can do it on-prem, you can do it in cloud. And, and while it's not a big modernization, it does give you access to certain benefits that you don't have managing your own infrastructure on-prem. So that's great. Rebuild is so sexy. Everybody loves to rebuild because you're looking at something and you're saying, this is total crap. There's so much technical debt. I can't believe these jokers did this, right? And so you want to go build your own new technical debt and your own stuff that people will look at in the future and say, this is total crap. So that's great. We, like, rebuild is sexy, but it takes a lot of skill and maturity. Now, does your company have that skill and maturity? Maybe. And, and if so, great. Then chase it. Go rebuild. But uh, just on the spectrum of when it works and when it doesn't, if you're going to lift and shift, low risk, it's going to happen. You can map it out. You can turn it into a project. You can turn it into action items. Super easy. You want to rebuild? Then think carefully about how you approach that rebuild, because I've seen a lot of rebuilds fail. Okay. Now, what to do when modernization projects don't go as hoped? People will build with the tools that are available to them. I think this, this is really important. Um, as an example, I recently visited the Google offices in Boulder, Colorado. Has anybody here ever been in a Google office? I came home the other day from, from Boulder, Colorado, and I was talking to my family. I've, I've got five kids. One's away at college. My youngest is seven. And, um, and one of them said, hey, the Google office is like Disneyland, but for grown-ups. And I'm like, yeah, it kind of is. And so here are a couple of interesting rooms in the Google office. On the left there is a fully stocked bike uh, garage. So you've got bike mounts, all the tools you could imagine. They even have like a, 
a flame-proof box where they keep oil and you know, other things, lubricants and so on. And so if I ride my bike into the office, which is a big deal up there in Boulder, Colorado, then I can come in and work on it. I can change out the tires. I can do maintenance. And I've got a fully stocked shop. On the right, what you see is a recording studio with keyboard, synthesizer, all of the electronics, a drum set, uh, electric guitars. And I can just go in there and start plunking around. And guess what? I sat down at those drums. And do I know how to play the drums? No. Did I give it my best shot? Yeah, you bet I did. So, so what I would say, though, is that if you're running into problems, consider retooling. Consider thinking about how do we approach this? How are we thinking about this? How, what, what, what agreements do we have in place that we could, we could reimagine? And, and I would say that creativity solves more problems than strength. So, so I, I, and, and honestly, when you see my list here, like find and read some case studies of successful projects similar to yours. It's a great thing to do if you're stuck. Uh, take a course or get a cert certification, that's also great. Go rock climbing. How many of you have gone rock climbing when you're stuck on a problem? I, I promise you, this is so amazing. Just getting out and using your body. And I've even got down here, paint something, record some music. Go for a bike ride or a run. Um, fall back to a different migration approach. There are lots of different things. In fact, even that middle one. Double check that it makes sense to modernize this thing right now. It might, and it might not. So, so just open yourself up to the realm of possibilities. And get out of your chair, go for a walk, go for a swim, go climb something, go surfing down at Galveston. Your project didn't fail because it's impossible. You just haven't found the right path yet. So try again. Now, do you remember the recording studio picture I showed you? Did any of you see the trash can? So when you zoom in on that, it says broken gear, put it here. Now, I think this is so cool because the people who designed this space, they anticipated breakage. They're not penalizing you. They're not saying, you broke the headphones? They're saying, oh, the headphones are broken, so we need some new headphones. So put it in here so that the managers of this space know to get new headphones so that we can keep using this space. Sometimes stuff doesn't work out. Document it and keep moving forward. So objection handling and expectation setting. Set achievable expectations. Plan for education and skill acquisition. That's really important. Um, and, and this could be you know, just giving people time. It could be hiring external uh, like people to come in and give live training. It could be anything in there, but plan for it. Plan for some breakage and accommodate it rather than penalizing it. Know that things are going to go wrong. Things are, you know, you're going to buy things that you didn't need or that didn't work out. You're going to build things that fail, that fall apart. Um, anticipate delivering iteratively. I think iterative development is a, is a huge win. Um, you can always improve, and you almost never get it perfect the first time. Break the problem down into the smallest parts that can be delivered independently. Choose realistic timelines. So these are, these are ways that you can start with expectations that are manageable. And, and one thing that I do, um, and this, this is a big thing, anytime I'm mentoring a new programmer, a new developer, a new, um, any person in a technical role, really, um, I, I point out that most of us go to management, go to leadership, we even go to our own team and we say, hey, I've got this cool idea that I think we should do. Can I do this? And we ask that question. And what do we often hear back? Way too often. We hear back, oh, well, you know, yeah, that's a cool idea, but uh, we don't have time or resources or we don't have money or something else is priority. So, <coughs> so yeah, let's, let's do that thing. But we're going to do it later, or you know, oh, we just bought this other thing, and so so we're going to do this other thing, and so what I tell people is to do it. Don't ask permission. And by the way, big caveat here: this works for me. I have no problem doing something and putting myself out there. I don't. I love getting yelled at for doing something that I thought could improve the company, the team, the product, whatever. Um, if that's not your style, if this like puts you into full anxiety mode, this might not be your approach. But here's what happens if you do the thing and then you go talk to your boss. Your boss is like, we didn't have time for that. And besides, and then he starts going down this list. If this was going to be in production, it would have to have this and this and this. And you didn't think about this group and this person. Do you realize, though, that he just gave you an itemized list 
of everything you need to do to take this little experiment and turn it into something production ready. You've reframed the conversation. You're still talking about the same thing. You're just talking about it from the side of what do I need to do to deliver this to production, not can I try doing this. So reframe the conversation. This is a really big tool. I love it. Objection handling. I think objection handling starts before you do the work. It starts with um, the beginning of the project, make sure everybody agrees on the reason that modernization makes sense from an organizational perspective. Keep the focus on the outcomes and the activities, not the tools and the methods. Reframe the conversation is a great way to, to manage objections. Um, accept that there might be new requirements and ask for the new expectations. This is big. Business circumstances change. Like in the last six months, how many of you have seen big changes in your companies due to the macroeconomic environment that we're, we're operating in? I think, you know, and those of you that aren't raising your hand, it's just because you don't know about them yet. They're having the conversations. It's, it's a mess out there. And, and so when things change, don't get bummed out and like, oh, no, you guys, you know, now we can't do this. Say, yeah, hey, we've got new expectations. Let's, let's figure out what those are to, to keep going forward and stay focused on business value. So where do I go from here? I would say start with people. Start with the people that are interested in, in delivering value to whoever consumes what it is that you build. Start with the people who build that and deliver that value. Align those people with the business goals and with their own personal objectives in their career, in their income, and where they want to live. And then start breaking some gear. And when you're done, come talk to me. I want to hear your modernization story. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, I'm fine. Um, I, is there time for questions? Does anybody have questions? We have like two minutes. Two minutes? OK, I'm going to brave these steps again. <laughs> Any questions? Um, do you have a question? Yeah. So I like the approach about uh, reframing the conversations. <laughs> I do that. I've been doing that pretty much all my career. Give yeah. me a list of things, right? Just plant a seed, and then when they object, you, you build out uh, a list of, you're building a list now of things on how to succeed, right? Uh, but what do you do if you, or, or I guess, uh, how would you handle an encounter where, you know, you got that list, you perfected or at least run down most of the things on that list and they still object? What, what is your strategies for, like, you know, a double object, objection, I guess. Yeah, that's, or the so that's hypocrisy, a great. Right? <laughs> yeah, in other words, you do it, you answer all the questions, now you've got a perfect thing ready to go, and they're still like, nah. Well, what I would say is go find a new project. In, in other words, the, the longer you stay hung up on something that people aren't going to adopt, the more frustrated and dissatisfied you're going to be with your life. And there are so many interesting problems to solve in this world that if you get stuck on one and, and don't go find something that'll be satisfying, then some of that's on you, I, I would say. And, and not every good idea, in fact, a lot of good ideas, just, they just get passed over. Um, yeah. Question, how do you kind of convince your peers and your leads to kind of buy into your idea, right? Like, you know, hypothetically, it's like, hey, MongoDB is super cool. I want to, like, change how I do run Greenfield applications. But everybody else is like, well, you know, we're always RDB, so why don't we just stick with it? Right? How do you convince your peers and your leads to do that? Yeah, okay, that's a great question. Um, I know this is a technical audience. I, I spent years working in advertising, a lot of years in direct sales. There's a book written by Claude Hopkins. It was published back in the 1920s, and it's called My Life in Advertising. And it's basically, anyway, it's like the Bible of modern advertising. You won't find an advertising executive who doesn't know this book. And in it, he says that the most compelling way to sell something is with a powerful demonstration. So you know, if you're watching late night TV, maybe that doesn't even exist anymore. But you remember back in the day when you used to have the infomercials come on and they've got the Ginsu knives? They're not cutting tomatoes. They're cutting like metal plumbing pipes. You know, they're like, oh yeah, this can cut through anything. And you're like, oh, okay, well if they can cut through a metal pipe, then it for sure is gonna cut my tomatoes really well, right? So in other words, what I would say, and that's part of reframing the conversation, is you want to, to provide a powerful demonstration. If you think you've got a technology that's going to change the way you deliver value, 
as a team, then put together a demonstration of that value. Say, look guys, hey, I, I did this in, in a day, and, and this used to take me a week, and this technology will allow us to do it this way, and it will further your careers by, by aligning to it, because look at this ecosystem, and on and on. So you, you, want, a, you want a compelling demonstration, is what I would say, for your, your peers. Okay, thanks so much, guys.